Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. It's great to be here at the conference. It's great to see some um, some familiar faces uh, and some familiar names. Um, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm Dan. Uh, at Catalyst, I'm the Community Development Manager. So as part of my role is to interact with people in the community, like yourselves, on plugin developments. Um, so some of that could be related to the plugins that we look after and we release to the community, but also working with you on some of the plugins that you might develop that we might be interested in using as well. And I'm also a plugin guardian, so I'll help um, David from Moodle HQ look after the, the plugin database itself on Moodle.org. And we have a, a number of volunteers and, and people that help review those plugins, so I wanted to talk a wee bit about that. But before I get into that, um, can I get a bit of an indication here of how many people would consider themselves as either a software developer or previous software developer um, uh, in, in, in previous roles? If you just give me a sense of hands here, yeah, cool. And um, of, of the other people in the room as well, is there anyone in here that's actually had a plugin reviewed by me in that process? Yeah, there's, there's a few hands going up, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, hopefully some of this is, a, <laughs> that was a very straight hand. Hopefully that wasn't a, um, a reflection of the how you felt about that review. Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, at the plugin database, uh, really great resource in, in, in Moodle. Uh, I just updated the slide just five minutes ago because it's constantly changing. Uh, but there's some impressive numbers there. 2,288 approved plugins that extend Moodle in, in crazy ways, ways that none of us would ever think about possible, um, uh, some that are really simple but solve a really amazing problem, uh, and some that are really complex and, and provide uh, a significant feature set to your to your site. Um, and, and some other pretty impressive stats there, like 1,280 developers uh, in that ecosystem working on plugins and, and um, re releasing to the community. Heaps of recent downloads, which is insane. Um, and that's, that's weird because they're downloading that plugin to install on their sites. That must mean that there are a lot of sites using those plugins, right? If you think about that, there's, there's other stats there as well. Um, just in terms of what's their waiting, there are currently 51 plugins that developers have written and submitted to the plugins database that are waiting for someone to come along and review. And unfortunately, the time frame to get those things to review is pretty varied. Uh, some of our, uh, the plugins that land get a really quick review. Uh, I see there were about three, uh, three submitted last night in the last sort of 10 to 12 hours. And sometimes a, a volunteer might go, hey, that's a really cool feature. I'd like to have a look at that and it could get reviewed within a day. But then there are other plugins that have been sitting there for months. Uh, and uh, the, the key thing is that the, the database is maintained by volunteers. Uh, so if they're interested in something, they might jump in there and review it. But we try and encourage them to alternate uh, first in, first out, but also a last in, last out process. So sometimes I might pick something at the top of the queue. Sometimes I might pick at the bottom of the queue. Sometimes I might go, hey, there's something in the middle there that looks quite interesting. It might be a plagiarism plugin. Maybe Dan, Dan might want to have a look at that one. Um, so sometimes it, it's, it's a bit varied. But it would be great if you have some sort of knowledge to help engage in that process because it's a great resource. Uh, and if you've been through that review process yourself, you probably understand a little bit how it goes. Um, and uh, it, it gives you nice sort of warm fuzzy feelings when you see plugins released to the database that other people start using, so it's cool. Um, so the plugin database review that does occur is pretty basic. It's, it's not strenuous. We don't ask the volunteers to spend weeks testing and reviewing the code. It's a, a quick pass through the code base, have a look through all of the, 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 the basic parts of it, and we make suggested improvements. Um, some of those are clear blockers for approval in the plugins database, and I'll get to a bit of that later on. Uh, and other things are a bit more informational, like, hey, that, that for each loop there that you've got with a database query and then an embedded database query, you're actually running 200 database queries when you can do one. Um, and so we give some general feedback also in things like accessibility and other bits and pieces that the, the reviewer might notice. Um, and that review for the plugins database only happens the very first time it goes through that process. So once the plugin's approved, that review process doesn't happen again in that format. So if you've got a plugin that's been released into the database five, six, seven years ago, it hasn't been through that process. And so there could be a new developer working on it, it could be um, a, a range of developers working on it, and you can't always trust that the 
the, the tick boxes that were previously checked on that first version still will check now. Obviously, it may not support the new version too. Um, when a plugin developer comes to the queue, they, they, they get a, a report a wee bit like this, um, uh, the reviewers, and they can choose anything they want. Um, uh, this is listing the not yet approved plugins. You can actually see something similar to this report if you go to the plugins database, click on the, the block on the right hand side, there's some reports there and something similar to this. Um, some of the things we look for include renamed plugins. Uh, <laughs> you might recognize at least one of, well, maybe three of the people in that photo. Um, uh, occasionally we see plugins from, from developers who are inexperienced, happens a wee bit with themes, and what they've done is they've gone and taken a theme, they've renamed it, and then they've submitted it to the plugins database with no other changes. They've also often removed the copyright headers and said, Dan Marsden didn't write this, it was Brendan someone, you know, and, and so the, the review team has to be aware that sometimes we just need to check what is, where is the original code for this? Um, sometimes it's perfectly fine, it's, it's GPL, you, you take the code, but you need to retain the ownership or the copyright headers and say, I copied this code from Dan's theme called Classic um, and I've added these cool new features. And as long as I've done that and I've added features and they have referenced the previous developer, it's all good. Uh, another thing we often find is untested plugins. Um, I was talking to Martin um, the other day and reminding him of the time that we were first sort of working on Moodle and when he gave me a few more keys and access, we would push code into the, the CVS repository at the time and it would get uploaded to Moodle.org and then we'd do our testing and then find, hold on, we've just broken Moodle.org, we better fix that and push the change back in. Um, so as developers, we're pretty notorious for not testing well. You know, we enjoy the, the, the development, but um, it's, it's quite important that you test it because sometimes someone might go and grab that plugin, install it into their, their, their site, and it could just completely destroy the site. It could shut down, um, it could delete data, it could do anything. So we need to make sure that they're tested. And this is a process that anyone can engage with, really. If you're able to install plugins from the plugins database, then you can go and help us with the review process by just testing and then dropping a comment in and saying, hey, I've just tested this with Moodle 4.5, and it looks amazing. Or it, it breaks these things here or it throws these, these problems. Um, another thing we watch out for is empty shells. Uh, so it's a, a plugin that doesn't actually do anything at all. Uh, sometimes it's a test plugin. I'm just testing the plugins database and I've written this thing that says hello world and I'm uploading it to the plugins database. Well, that's not really what we want to share to the community. Uh, it's, it's, it's not really doing anything. Um, sometimes they perform things that already exist. Hey, I've added a feature. Did you know if you went and clicked this tick box over here in the Moodle administration panel, you could actually enable that feature and it's in there in core. You, 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 there, there's some sort of process there, some validation that we need to do. Uh, the other thing that does happen a bit is, is uh, external organizations like the Moodle ecosystem, they see Moodle as a possible advertising platform, they want to advertise to Moodle users, and so they create something that doesn't do anything except provide a logo or marketing information, and that's that's clearly not providing functionality that we want in the plugins database, so it, it, it you know we push it back. Um, another thing we run into a bit is anonymous logins, uh, allowing anyone in the world to log into your site as anyone in your site. So you think about a plugin that sits in your site, uh, and I go and say, I'm Martin Dugiamis, really I am, and log in, and all of a sudden I have administration access to your system. Plugins can do this, and we see this a bit with, with things that are submitted to the database, so we need to make sure that they don't do that as part of our review process. Another thing that we see a bit is information leaks. I'm not sure if you recognize that vegetable. Um, that's when a plugin takes information about your users or your site and sends it to an external system. Happens a lot with those commercial integrations as well, uh, where Moodle has some information it sends to Moodle HQ, but it's very transparent about that information. It says, you're registering the site, here's the information we're gonna send to Moodle along with that information. Quite often, plugins behind the scenes collect information about your user numbers, the file sizes, the server operating system that's being used, your email addresses, and they send that back to an internal system for them to use for marketing purposes or who knows what, because they haven't told you they're doing it. Um, so we also watch out for that quite a bit. We have quite a big checklist 
uh, when we go through that review process. There's a link down the bottom there. I'm sorry, it's not very accessible. Um, I'll, I'll try and fix that <laughs> later. Um, I've, I'm going to focus on sort of three main areas of that checklist, uh, the metadata, usability, and coding. Um, metadata is the information we know about the plugin, so that's the, the name, the description, what versions it supports, um, uh, screenshots of the plugin in use, documentation, that sort of information. There's some clear things that we ask for you to have in, in a plugins database entry. We also check some basic usability things. Does it do what we expect when you install it? Does it say what it does out of the box? Um, and, and we report some of that other stuff as well. But also coding. So a big chunk of our review process is on the code. Um, and I'll, I'll get into more of that soon too. One of the cool things about a Moodle plugins database is it does this thing called a pre-check report. If you're familiar, if you're doing Moodle development now, you, you'll know there are CI tools that run in GitHub um, that generate reports to say whether your code complies well with the Moodle coding guidelines. This is available to everyone in the, uh, uh, when you're viewing a Moodle plugin in the plugins database, you go and find the plugin. Down the bottom of that download button you'll see on the page, there's a wee code pre-checks link. If you click on that link, it takes you to the, the bigger panel down the bottom that says how this code or this plugin complies with some standard things. There's some key things in that list. Um, one of them, the first one's called PHP Lint. And that's basically saying, does the PHP code actually work when an automated tool opens it? Is it valid? And if that one's read, it's a high chance that someone installing that plugin is going to have issues with it. That, that first one needs to be green. Uh, the rest of them, don't need to be green, but they're good indicators of how uh, of the quality of the plugin, how well they're maintained. This one is actually one of mine, um, so it's 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 often that it's not green all the way along. Uh, don't be concerned about that, but it's a good indicator. If you're seeing lots of green ticks there, it's probably that that it's it's pretty good. Um, I am going to go a wee bit technical in this next slide, um, but I'll try not to get too bogged down in this. Um, I've thrown a whole lot up on that slide because I'm, I, I don't want to um, go through lots of slides uh, and take up too much time today. But there's some really obvious things we do in security. Uh, is the user actually authenticated to the system? Uh, or are they just a user that has opened a web page and gone and looked at the page and we're just presenting that information? So for Moodle code, most of us here in the room that are developers will know one of the first things we need to see on a, on a page is a require login call. Uh, and that can be a require login call that's just really basic. Um, does the user have an authentication into the site? If you are doing an activity plugin, or, or something that's in, inside a course activity, you kind of want to put a course parameter in that as well to say, are they logged in and do they have access to this course? And so that can happen in that one simple line. I want to see that require login. If I don't see that, it's a warning flag. Um, we also want to see straight after that a check for capabilities. Moodle's capabilities uh, infrastructure is really flexible. So you can create your own capabilities inside the plugin, but we want to see that capability check straight away to say, Dan is logged in. Okay, can Dan actually do this thing? But also, can Dan do this thing in this particular place? One of the common mistakes we see is where you have a page that might display user information. So we check, Dan's logged in. We check, can Dan see this page? Yes. Can see this pa Dan see this page when he's looking at Brendan's data. And so you need to make sure that, that I can't see Brendan's information on that same page. Because in the URL of the, the, the site, often we have parameters. One of those parameters could be a user ID. I could type in a user ID up the top and say, I want to be Brendan. And if I'm able to see Brendan's information and I shouldn't be able to, that's, that's a sign that the security check's not there. Um, SQL queries, database queries. Um, Quite often we see developers that are developing in their own environment and they forget that the MDL prefix on tables is a setting inside Moodle. So if you write a SQL query in your code and you put the text MDL, it might work on your site, but as soon as I go install that on one of my sites that uses a custom prefix, everything will fail. So we check that as well. And also when you're injecting parameters into that SQL query. So if you've got a select query with a parameter, make sure you're using placeholders. If you don't know what placeholders are, come and chat with me later on or have a look at some of the documentation. There's a lot of information about SQL. Um, really, really important stuff. I also do a search 
on the code base, sometimes the first time I open it, can I find a get, post, or request uh, bit of text? If I see that text anywhere in your code, it's an immediate security failure. And I will probably send it back and say, please go and do some work and send it back when you've reviewed the checklist, and I will or have a look again after you've reviewed the checklist yourself. Uh, those are ways of taking information in the URL and placing them into your code, uh, but you can never, ever trust user input. Uh, you think about a shopping cart scenario, you often have a wee text box that says, I want one of these. Have a think about what would happen if you said, I want point one of this particular product. So your shopping cart might round up, but then your pricing might be 10% of the price. Or what happens when you put negative one in that field? So Moodle has a, a tool called, well, an API called required or, or optional param, and that allows you to clean that data. And that's what you use to get that information instead of call and get post requests in your code directly. Um, we also have in that required or optional param API something called a, um, a, a type. So you say this parameter that I'm getting given, user ID, it's an integer, a number. So I'm expecting an integer, so I use that field param int. There's another option there called param raw, which does absolutely nothing. And it's really useful if you're getting a file or you're doing something with quite complex data structures, but quite often as developers we forget that that particular thing is not doing anything and not cleaning anything, so we check your param raw use. It's also used quite often in your web services or in your um, uh, Moodle forms because you have the ability to set different types of that data and, and those APIs as well. So we often do a quick search for Pram raw. Um, CS key is a bit of an interesting one. If you don't understand CS key, it's, it's to help prevent CSRF attacks. If you are creating your own custom form that performs an action that doesn't use any of the normal APIs, quite often that's something like a, a link. You click on a link and say, I want to delete this thing in my page. And what it does is it sets a web parameter in the URL going delete equals one. And you send that back to the page. Sys key allows you to go, is this actually a person clicking a link right now? Or is this someone that has cleverly taken a URL, posted it into a forum post somewhere hidden in an image, and when I as a teacher open that forum post, all behind the scenes, it's sending that message to, to delete that thing. And I'm logged in as the admin, so that works. But if I haven't checked the Sys key, all of a sudden, the student has cleverly hidden, found a hidden way to allow you to delete that data. So check your CSK use on, on those actions as well. Um, this next slide covers something that I see the most in the plugins database now from both experienced developers and non-experienced developers. I've seen this from my team at Catalyst, um, and I see this from, from other, other uh, people as well. It's really, really easy to get this wrong. Web services. Uh, happen behind the scenes. So if, if you're familiar with Ajax or, or JavaScript based actions, when you do something behind the scenes, you want to make a call to, the, to, to Moodle to say, hey, the students clicked on this link behind the scenes, send this message, do this thing. And that might be something like return a list of users for a drop down list so that you're, you're, you're offloading your, um, your work to a separate call. Or it could be deleting something, take an action, those sorts of things. Um, I'm not sure how well it displays there, but this top section up here is the um, area that you define in the services.php file. So if you're creating a web service, there's kind of two parts that you, you have to do. One is a file called services.php in the DB folder, and you place the function information, and you give it a name, and in that sort of definition, you also say, what are the capabilities the person needs to call this thing? The important thing to know is that capabilities list does not do anything useful from a development perspective. That capabilities list is informational only in that top dbservices.php. Moodle does not check that capability anywhere. It's used on the interface when you're creating a web service as a, an administrator. You're, you're, you're saying, I want to create a new web service. These are the functions it needs to call. And informational, it gives you, uh, the information it gives you is says, these are the web service capabilities we think you need. And quite often, if you've gone through that process yourselves, you'll find that that list of things is not complete. 
and you'll end up going, you'll try it, you'll set those capabilities for a user, and then you have to change some things again. So what you have to do, you must, 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 must do, if you have any web services in your plugins, go back and check the, the, the execute functions and make sure that you have a validate context call, not a require login call. Require login does some redirects, so you don't want to use require login in your web services. The validate context does that for you, and a require capability call. Because if all you've done is check the user's logged in, anyone in the site can call that web service and do that thing. Uh, we see it, I see it so much, it's, it's crazy. Um, but it's an easy mistake to make. The other thing we talk about is Frankenstyle. Um, if you haven't heard of Frankenstyle before, it's a naming convention sort of created by Moodle to uniquely identify a plugin. Uh, so the Frankenstyle name of the attendance plugin is mod underscore attendance. The Frankenstyle name of the uh, recompletion plugin, another one I do, is local underscore rec recompletion, and that's the Frankenstyle name. Now that must be used in a number of places. The first one, the most important, is the install.xml file. If you have any tables in your, your plugin, all of those tables must be prefixed with that Frankenstyle name. And the main reason that is, is if someone uninstalls your plugin, their Moodle core goes, hey, They've clicked the uninstall link, find all of the things that start with that Frankenstein name and remove them from the database. So it helps clean up process. Also classes, function names, constants, um, plugin configuration, they also need to use that Frankenstein name as well. There's a heap of documentation on this, so go and have a look at the docs, come talk to me later. Um, another thing we talk about, a wee bit, I'm actually going to whip through this a wee bit quicker, is, is CSS. One of the common mistakes that developers sort of make is that the styles.css file is not just used inside your plugin. Moodle collects all of the styles.css files from all of the plugins in the site and combines them into one file and then caches that and sends it to the web browser. So everything you write in that styles.css file applies everywhere on the site. So if you say table header, make it red all of the table headers in your whole site will be read. Uh, if you have something that you think is specific enough and you create, hey, I've got this plugin called content and I'm going to call a class content1. And so you make content1 read everywhere. There might be lots of other content1 classes and other plugins in the site and you're only testing your plugin in the interface. Another client comes along and tries to use your plugin, all of their content1 headings are read. So it's really important to use that well, it's almost like the Frankenstein name, but you actually prefix uh, the selector with some extra parts. So uh, these slides will be available later too, so feel free to, um, to come and have a look. Uh, we also check copyrights and third-party libraries. Also important for Moodle and protecting the brand, uh, and also the GPL. Uh, there are some third-party libraries that are really easy to install in GPL code. Uh, but there are some third-party libraries that come with restrictive licenses, like you can use this, but not if you're the military, or you can use this, but only if you follow these instructions. And so anything that contains a clause that may not be compatible with GPL can't be distributed by Moodle in the plugins database. Moodle is seen partly as the person providing the zip file on, on Moodle.org, so they need to protect their legal responsibilities as well, um, particularly with the GPL. I have a, uh, a payment gateway plugin uh, for a, a Chinese payment gateway, and they have an API that has no license. So I can't include their code into my payment gateway. So I have to distribute the payment gateway and the API separately. I say, here's the payment gateway code, the PHP, go and grab that library over there. Uh, we also ask you to um, make sure that the third party libraries file is also included that references those libraries as well. Um, I can talk more about this sort of stuff uh, and I can go on and on about it, but I'll, I'll try and leave it there for some questions. Um, feel free to come and ask me later. I've also got some cards here. If you, if you miss the chance, come and grab a card and flip me an email. Hopefully that's useful. Thank you, Dan. So maybe one question. We have time for one question only. Oh, thank you. That was very, very helpful. But uh, obviously, as a plug-in reviewer, not reviewer, but uh, user myself, do you have a process for, for graveyarding or archiving? Is there any kind? Of, I mean, there's a lot out there. And do you guys have anything in mind that you do or somebody review? Or is that up to the developer to graveyard it or 
Yeah, it's it's hard. It's not an easy one. Um, no, it's not. Uh, it, it depends. Um, usually, we have in the, for the plugin starter base, we like to put things up for a adoption. So we have an adoption process. When a, a, a developer says, "I've moved on, I'm not going to be reviewing, I'm not going to work on it anymore," we have an adoption process, and and it allows the community to say, "Hey, that's a really cool plugin. I want to do that." And we've picked up a few plugins ourselves that we've gone. Our clients really need this. The developers not using doing it anymore. We'll take it on. So there's been a few that Catalyst have done. I know other community members have as well. So that's probably the closest sort of thing to to graveyarding. No, it's not an easy one. But yeah, come and chat later if you need to.